Okay. Everybody still hear me? Give me a thumbs up, Jeannie. You hear me? Okay, good. Oh, wow. Okay, let me say a quick prayer, mainly for me. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, we just ask for your help and your protection on each one and just help me to get my spirit back and uh, just ask for your holy presence upon each one of us and uh, help my frustration in Jesus' holy name. We just thank you for your goodness, Lord, in Jesus' name. And ask amen. your protection upon the meeting for each one. Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so the title of this is uh, The Birth of Jesus and Possibly the Man-Child too. And if, if when I sent that out, you thought, oh boy, what's this heretic got now? Uh, well, that's what I would have thought, too. So don't feel bad, because if anybody would have said that to anybody else, I, I would have thought, oh, no, you know, what are you talking about? You know, and so. So anyway, uh, it was now changed to the birthday of Jesus. Well, like I, I already said that, but originally this sermon was going to be uh, the house of bread. And then I don't know if you can see up here the blue screen. And then I wrote myself a note in blue here. And I said, will this take off, comma, or no? And it seemed in my head like that would be a good idea to have a sermon on the house of bread and kind of go in and uh, talk about how Jesus was born in Bethlehem, meaning house of bread, you know, Bethlehem. And then talk about how the man child will also be born in, in the house of bread. Uh, but anyway, I'll go by my notes here so I don't get lost. Uh, but I will take you on the same ride that I have been on this week, except I'll leave out the vexation and attacks I've been under. So I wrote all that before this latest one here, getting on to Zoom. So I jokingly say i'll spare you that part but it makes me wonder if indeed something is important in this uh as i say you can see on the blue note that i wrote to myself at the top of the page <clears throat> uh as i was preparing the bethlehem study but for some strange reason it was just not seeming to go uh and I prayed and asked the Lord what was wrong. You know, I was just kind of praying, you know, not really thinking I would get an answer. You know, I, not, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but you know how when you just pray and you're just kind of asking what's wrong here. And it was like, did I do something wrong? Uh, is it because I haven't prayed? Uh, am I supposed to cancel the Zoom study? You know, it was like, what's going on here? Why am I so troubled? And so that's why I wrote that blue note at the top of the page. Like, is this gonna, you know, uh, take off or what, you know? And so, first of all, I promised that I wouldn't portray a date for the man child to be born if I didn't have some proof that was at least somewhat possible. I wouldn't say something wild like that just to get every, you know, just to get things pumped up or to get everyone to come. But I admit I was also having a little fun with that announcement. Uh, so it will take a bit to lay this out, but I'll just take you on the same ride that I went on. And then, as I said, uh, this started as a study of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And, you know, that's kind of what I was wanting to show how the man child is also going to be born out of the house of bread, the bread of life, the true bread. Uh, but it soon changed to another aspect of Jesus' birth. Some of this today comes from things we know and have studied, such as Revelation 12 being the birth of the man child. 
but much of this comes from other sources who have far greater understanding of astronomy than I have. But I have tried to vet these sources to see who is solid on what they bring. So my initial study started with this, which was Matthew 2, 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, Behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. So, you know, Bethlehem means house of bread, as I said. And it says it was in the city of Judah, which Judah means praise. So, you know, that means that Jesus came forth out of the house of bread, which is located in praise. So the bread that has its foundation in praise is what will bring forth. So it's not just the praise, but also the bread. You know, we need both. So anyway, that's where I was going. But like I say, it was just not clicking. And so here's where the message changed to. I was thinking about uh, Revelation 12, and I was reading... Luke 21:25. Uh, so, but before I get to that, you know, the word of God is like a diamond that you can kind of hold up in the air. And as you turn it and twist it, you'll see new beauty, you know, in different, this big diamond, you'll see new things as you, new ways that the light comes uh, you know, as you turn and look at that diamond. So I kind of look, you know, this something caused me to look at this whole thing from a completely new way. Uh, you know, having looked at Revelation 12 from a certain way for 40 years or however long it's been, and then all of a sudden to kind of look at it from a new way. So that's where I'm going here. So Revelation 21, 25, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and upon the earth dismay among nations. So this is uh, Jesus speaking about the end times. <clears throat> so signs in the sun, moon and stars, then a couple verses later, but when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So we know that the rapture is going to come and catch us away before some of the real heavy things. But when these signs begin to take place, you know, that's when our redemption is drawing near. So then in, in blue here, I have another note to myself. And it was just kind of saying, you know, knock, knock on the head, you know, how if you ever have those feelings like, hello, why didn't you ever see this? You know, that's what I was thinking to myself. And so I, I, I thought, remember the great sign in heaven in Revelation 12? Uh, here below are signs in the sun, moon and stars that happened at the very end times that Jesus was talking about in Luke 21 that we just read. For some reason, I don't remember ever connecting those two scriptures. Remember the time key is the seventh head of the beast is crowned, uh, i.e. it's end times in Revelation 12. So that would fit perfectly with what Jesus just said in Luke 21. But like I say, for some bizarre reason, I never put the two things together. So I had not looked at the diamond in that way before, connecting it to Luke and Matthew, where Jesus speaks of signs in the heavens and in the end times. So I'll read Revelation 12, 1 here. And it says, a great sign appeared in heaven. So that was kind of the knock, knock, you know, hello, you know, maybe this is what Luke 21 is talking about. 
So a, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And this word, uh, Liddell and Scott, Greek English dictionary, this word sign, uh, the Greek word you see here, it can mean a couple different things, but he says, especially of the constellations. So I, you know, a few years ago, knew nothing of the constellations, but it seems like over the last, especially the last couple months, I've kind of just been learning a little bit because I feel like I was so ignorant about how the sun and the moon and the constellations work. And so continuing here, I have written, it says, in our day, when they want us all dumbed down slaves, we are not taught a lot about this astronomical information. At least I wasn't. But in Jesus' day, there's lots of evidence that they were very aware of the constellations and planetary movements. So continuing in Revelation 12 with this sign. Like the wise men, you know. Right. Excellent point, Jeannie. Thank you. So continuing with this sign, and remember, you know, when you're looking for a sign that's in the sun and moon and stars, you have to look up to see that, you know, that when we're on earth, that's the only way you're going to see that sign is by looking up. So Revelation 12, 2, uh, talking about this woman with crown of 12 stars and the moon under her feet and clothed with the sun. So we're gonna see how that all applies as we go forward here. And she was with child and she cried out being in labor and pain to give birth. Then the next verse says another sign. So now we really have what Jesus said because Jesus said there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars as we get to the end times and the time of the rapture. So now this next sign, Revelation 12, 3, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. So that's where we say these crowns. You know, he's got uh, seven heads, and all heads are crowned. So this is showing a time when the seventh head, seventh world government has been crowned. And verse four, his tail swept a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, what John saw was a, uh, you know, like a vision, uh, you know, he's in the spirit on the Lord's, you know, you know, on the Lord's day, I think it says, which is talking about, you know, the really a lot of the end times, but he's in spirit seeing these things up in heaven. And so some of it might be uh, natural, but some of it is, uh, you know, being shown to him as a movie in a sense, because obviously the dragon, uh, you know, his tail in heaven can't sweep down and throw stars down to the earth. You know, the earth would be completely crushed if one star hit us. And so, you know, some of this is symbolic that John is talking about, but it would also make sense that the constellations can show this picture at different times. Uh, Lori, can you mute? Because uh, we're hearing you a lot. I thought I muted right away. It's okay. Uh, I'm not. I muted in the beginning right away. I know, I but it's, it shows that you're not muted. Uh, 
yeah, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just saying we keep hearing. There you go. Uh, so, so after thinking about this, you know, I pulled out my, I've got four or five books that I, you know, kind of along the line of the star of Bethlehem and Christian astronomy. So I've, you know, some of the books I've never even opened, but I bought them at times because there were various times over the years when I kind of wanted to get into that and try to learn a little bit to see. So I pulled out those books to see if there might be any kind of astronomical sign in the constellations that might line up, you know, with the sun, moon, and stars, as Jesus said, or as John said, a woman and, you know, a crown of 12 stars. So reading here, uh, so I say, and wow, did I ever find some things? And I'll try to lay out some pieces of the puzzle and so just try to, as I lay these pieces of the puzzle out, you'll just have to kind of hold them in your head as we go along uh, and then put it all together at the end. You know, there's no other way to do it, but just kind of go one, one uh, point at a time. So we've, we've all studied how Revelation 12 cannot refer directly to the birth of Christ because the time keys show it happening during a period when the seventh head of the beast is crowned. And I don't know any astronomical researcher that knows that aspect of things. So when they look at Revelation 12, they're trying to, uh, you know, ha have it be, uh, you know, at Jesus birth and and so so they usually look at this and they look back at the times of Christ's birth and try to say well can this line up and so that's why I usually kind of clicked them off because I thought oh they're you know mixed up and, and thinking about this other scenario but I was thinking you know, just as I was digging into this, I was thinking that there's no reason this couldn't be a kind of double prophecy where the exact same signs in heaven pictured with man child's birth in Revelation 12. And, and these heavenly signs do often recur, you know, every month there's a different constellation, you know, that's up there and they all they all have dates so for instance uh well i'll get into that later but uh, as you know as these 12 you know and of course it makes sense that god would create 12 of them but as they spin around up in the heavenlies uh every year well as the earth is turning and you know like i say i'm not the pro at all this some of you probably know it better than i do or maybe a lot better i don't know but uh, you know, one month we might be in Capricorn and then the next month we're in Virgo or, or Leo, you know, and if you're like me, I always used to just click off when anybody would say anything about those kind of things, because it all just seemed like weird astrology kind of stuff, you know, but the scriptures talk about it a lot. So it is. Uh, something very real that God created. And so it, it then made sense to me that, yeah, if there was the exact same sign at Jesus' birth, that would make sense. Uh, you know, we know that the Passover in Egypt that pointed forward to Christ, our Passover was fulfilled on the exact same day. And we also know the day of Pentecost was fulfilled on the exact day that God had said 50 days after Passover, you know, that he had given in the law to Moses. So therefore, it's not a stretch to think that maybe the man child was also born on the same day with the same heavenly picture in the constellations 
as when Jesus was. So let's jump into this picture from a signs in the heavens kind of view or signs in the constellations idea and see what we come up with. And as I say, I don't claim to be a pro in these areas. So if I misspeak, feel free to correct me or add anything like you did there, Jeannie. That was really good what you said. Uh, but anyway, so I'll need to stay on topic to get all through this. Uh, so there does happen to be a 12 star crown known as Corona. And of course we know from the Corona COVID disease, the Corona means crown. So some say it's seven stars, but others connect five stars to it. There's kind of a, a row of seven and then there's a row of five right above it. Uh, so here's a picture. Now, please uh, tell me real quickly, those of you, and I know Lynn is one, but are there any others that uh, can't see this picture? Because I'm gonna, well, I know what I'll do. I'll just send a text to the group. Uh, with this picture so everybody can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, sorry, just one second. Let me. Okay, here it comes to the group. So, can any Lynn or anybody tell me if they got that text and can see the picture? Because I just want to say a couple things and want everybody. Huh? Hold on, let me look. It's Hold there. On, let me look. Yeah, Lori got it too. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, so in the picture you see at the very top, Corona Borealis. Can you see that? Yep. Looks just like a crown to me. Okay, Lynn, you can see it. Yeah, well, if everybody could, every time somebody responds in text, it, it shoots right through my screen and then I have to remove their text and then I have okay. to go back. <laughs> I, have to, I have to do a lot of jumping back and forth. So, okay, no more text for a minute know. while Lynn's <laughs> looking at the picture. No more texting. <laughs> no, I can see it. I, I just have to tap on it to open it to see it. Okay, tell me and when yes, you're ready. You ready, ready now? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Yes. So it Can says you hear me? I wasn't hearing you no, but now I do. So okay. anyway, yes, so I'm ready. Here's this crown with 12 stars and then there's one right in the middle too. Um uh, so, you know, and a lot of this stuff, you know, it depends, you know, NASA, for those that dig a little deeper, there's a lot of deception in a lot of this stuff because a lot of these world government kind of agencies are controlled and they, they want to confuse things. And uh, so it's, it's hard to dig in and, you have to go to the right sources sometimes. Anyway, uh, so this is this, what's known as Corona Borealis, and it's a constellation that's been seen for a long time. You see down here, this other one, uh, kind of below it and to the left says Serpens Kaput. Well, we'll talk about that one also, because uh, that's the serpent. So it would make sense that the serpent is also pictured right about where the woman is and probably about where the woman's stomach is. But 
So now this particular guy, I believe, thinks that uh, Christ was born in December, you know, like a lot of people think December 25th for Christmas. And so he's picturing things like Sagittarius that is right around Christmas. If you see off to the left, I don't know if you can see where my cursor's going, but so, but all I'm trying to say here is that the pieces of the puzzle are there and we'll see later. I'm just kind of showing you pieces right now. So he thinks the woman is this Ursa major constellation in the upper right corner, it's a woman coming down and she's upside down, if you can picture with her head and if you can see that in the upper right. Uh, he thinks that's the woman, but I don't think so, but we'll continue. So all the pieces of the puzzle are there for this to be an astronomical event. And the same information did take place in 3 AD or 4 AD when Jesus was born. In my book, I, you know, I, I used the, the NASA, NASA had a site where you could go all the way back before Christ and see when the full moons occurred. And because I was sure that Christ was crucified on a Thursday and not a Friday, or Wednesday, like is taught today, and like the Catholic Church says it was Friday. And so I went all the way, and the only one I could find that looked like it would be on a Thursday was in 30 AD. And that made sense because 40 years later to the day, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm going off notes here, but 40 years to the day later is when Rome came in and it says all that Israel was walled up in the city for the Passover when Rome attacked. So it was li literally 40 years to the day in 70 AD. And so this was the one year, uh, 30 AD, when I found a Passover that would have hap could have happened right on Thursday. Uh, now that NASA site has been taken down, but thankfully I copied it into a Word document, so I still have it. And uh, so astronomical science shows that a Passover full moon occurred on Thursday, which was the 14th of Nisan in the year 30 AD. Jesus was approximately 33 and a half years old at death, is, is what most people believe. Uh, having begun his three and a half year ministry at age 30, which we see in Luke 3.23. Uh, now, Daniel says that the Messiah would be cut off in the midst of the week. And so that's why most people think that uh that Jesus's ministry and plus they see him to you know going to three or possibly four passovers so that would be would fit with the three and a half year period you know year by year going to the passover once he became age 30 so so that three and a half year so what I did is I counted backwards from 30 AD and it gets a little tricky because uh, everyone agrees that Rome was off on their date of, you know, when they went from 1 BC to 1 AD. They know that Rome was a couple years off. Uh, and so they figure the birth of Christ, you know, some people say anywhere from like 2 BC to 6 BC. Well, in my book, uh, I put that I thought it was around 4 BC. And they say you're supposed to take also into account the zero year because it doesn't go from 1 AD, I mean, from 1 BC to 1 AD, that's, it's missing a year. There has to be a zero year. 
And just like you don't count from nine to 11, there has to be the 10, you know, or the zero. Uh, so, so I put in, in the book that Jesus would have been born around 4 BC. He did not make it to his 34th birthday, which would have been around September in the year 30 AD. So uh, now everybody, I'm not going to send this. I, I've got a lot of pictures and I'm not going to keep sending each one, but uh, it'll be on, uh, uh, you know, this recording and you can just take my word for some of this, but I'm, I'm looking here at the Jewish calendar of 30 AD. So you can see here in purple, that's uh, English. So this is April 6th in the year 30, in our, our year 30. And then over in the right, it shows Nisan and the 15th day, which they call the Passover, happening on, the, on Thursday that year. So anyway, I just thought it'd be interesting for you to see that. And this is the H, H, Lu H Hebrew calendar. They go all the way back to year zero, which is really a bummer because I wanted to go back to year three and four and see, you know, what things were there. Uh, and I'm guessing there might be another calendar out there that will do that. So if anybody ever finds one, please let me know. So as I say, most Christian astronomers, or all of them, picture Re Revelation 12 as showing the birth of Christ, because they think that's, you know, that the man-child is Jesus, and that's, you know, Mary fleeing into the wilderness and, and that kind of thing. But we've seen lots of reasons why that can't be. So the constellation known as Virgo, or the Virgin, or the maiden, the woman constellation, you can see in the blue, comes about every year between the dates of August 23rd and September 22nd. So this fits with Jesus having a September birthday, which is the time of the Jewish feasts, uh, tabernacles. And most people think, you know, that would be a good time for Jesus' birth, you know, a real prominent date uh, at the feast. So this is a big thing here that we're seeing a woman right at that time of when people think Jesus actually would have been born in this August 23rd to September 22nd date. So the constellation dates for the woman Virgo, who may have been pictured with child, was the blue date above, <clears throat> right during the seventh Jewish month where the Feast of Tabernacles takes place. So before, let me just give a few verses uh, from scriptures before we continue on constellations which God has made. And it seems that he has imparted this understanding to man, maybe from Adam in the beginning, and then Adam would have given the information for the thousand years he lived to all these different people, and they all would have passed it on down. Because, you know, when you just look up and you see some of these constellations, you say, well, that doesn't look like a horse, you know, and a guy shooting an arrow, you know, and how did anybody make that up? And so, but all the different uh, main uh, cultures seem to have a similar kind of view, like they all have seven days in the week that are named after the seven planets, Sunday, Moon Day, uh, Thor's Day. Now, we add in, uh, you know, heathen god, you know, but in the Hebrew, they weren't called that. They were called different names. Uh, but anyway, so, but all the nations that have, you know, advanced cultures have that seven-day week 
with the similar names. And so it shows kind of a where it was all together. And then as it spread out, the same information, you know, went to all these places. And I think that's true with the 12 constellations also. And of course, now with science, you know, and, and, and giant telescopes, they can find other groupings and constellations. But it does seem to be 12 that in Bible days, they were mainly understanding. So Job 9.8 says, who alone stretches out the heavens? So you can kind of see that he's just, he stretches them out, you know. And uh, Job 9.9, who makes the bear? And I believe that's a constellation. Orion and the Pleiades. Uh, if any of you have heard, uh, my wife went to school at one of the seven sisters, and that's what the Pleiades are called, the seven sisters. And I guess there's seven women's college over there in New York, and they're called the seven sisters. But so, so Job 38, 31 says, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? So God is talking to Job saying, can you lay out all these constellations can you you know put them out there like i've done uh and as i say uh, these uh pleiades is a star cluster in taurus so the bull taurus that's when you'll see the seven sisters and then job 38 32 canst thou bring forth the maseroth in his season and uh there's a few different resources that say the Maseroth is just a Hebrew word that speaks of all the constellations. Can you, can you bring this all forth in each one in his season, like I have done, you know? And uh, so it's kind of humbling to Job to think about it, you know, like, you know, now Job is going to say, I close my mouth. I've, I'm not going to say anything more, Lord, you're in heaven. I'm on earth, you know? So the Wheel of Stars book that I'll be quoting from today, uh, he says that the Maseroth is all the constellations. And he says there's 36 of them, which I'm not sure where he gets that information. I, some places say 86 or 90 that they've seen today. But, but anyway, I think there's the 12 main ones that are the 12 astronomical signs that recur year by year. And we've also seen that the 12 stars were the 12 tribes of Israel in Joseph's dream. So in Genesis 37, 9, I'm going to read from Joseph's dream here. And I'm sorry that I'm having to go quick, but to get all this done, I have to really zoom. Excuse the pun there. Uh, so Genesis 37, 9. Now, he still had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So if you ever want to make your brothers and your mom and dad mad, just tell them you had a dream like this, you know. Uh, so this is the only scripture I could find that, that talked about 12 stars. And really it says 11, but that's because Joseph is leaving himself out. He's the one star that wasn't bowing down. So Genesis 37, 10, you can see that his dad, Jacob, you know, who later, I mean, uh, his name was changed to Israel. Uh, the next verse, it says, and so he, Joseph, related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him. <laughs> so this is funny here. His father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have had? And it's, you know, it's not his fault. He just had the dream. But anyway, he says, what is the dream that you have had shall i and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow down ourselves before you to the ground so 
this is showing that Jacob knew what the dream was showing. You know, they were they were very sharp with these kind of things, and he didn't have to, you know, do a lot of study. He he knew right away what this dream was showing. And verse 11 says, and his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So his father was kind of basting on it, like, what's going on here? What does this mean? And uh, so back to Revelation 12, 1, a sign appeared in the heaven. So it is very likely that in those days, especially, they knew all these constellations. Uh, there's a lot of history that shows they 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 knew a lot more than you know and this guy in his book says that the people back then knew more than most college graduates today about how the constellations and the sun and the moon interact and move throughout the year you know we we know the basics you know that the earth goes around the sun and the moon is spinning around I know some days I, I've gone out and looked on a sunny day and you see the moon way off in the corner. And I, and I think, what in the world is the moon doing out? I thought it's supposed to come out at night, you know? So, you know, some of you probably know can a I lot ask, more. What's that? Can I ask a question when yeah. you're done? Yeah. Um, are you going to cover, are you going to cover the, the wise men following the star? Not today. Okay. But if we have time for comments and you want to bring a point on that, that would be great. And, you know, we can always. Kind of is my... Huh? Yeah, that kind of is my point is that they, you were talking about the wisdom that they had in following, understanding the constellations, you know, they had to have known these things, these wise men and their entourage had right. to have known yeah and you may read the stars and know what was happening you know yeah absolutely that's a good point lynn and janie you may not have heard uh, janie made that point earlier uh but that's a super good point that you know these guys came and they saw his star you know there was something they saw that knew it was the time of the messiah and and we are going to show that uh what they saw in the heavens but so yeah, I mean, they it wasn't just an overnight thing. It was for a couple of years they followed that star in order yeah. to find him. Yeah, well, we'll get to that later. Okay. I know different people okay. have different views on that, but uh, I think uh, there was literally one day when uh, things really point to it, but. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different ideas on what that star was and, and how that all laid out. But so anyway, Corona Borealis is a small constellation in the Northern Celestial Hemisphere. So that would make sense that it's above the woman. Uh, so this is from Wikipedia uh, and it's called Northern Borealis. Uh, its name, Latin name means Northern Crown. So again, that kind of fits, you know, and that was the picture that we sent. And uh, this picture that, that I showed everybody, that black one is uh, from the heavensdeclare.net. So they've got a bunch of good information there. Uh, the heavensdeclare.net, if anybody wants to dig in. So we're looking at that same black picture again and just kind of showing that Corona Borealis up in the north and then other constellations kind of swinging around underneath it. You see here is Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius. Uh, so he says, now this Revelation 12 woman also represents God's people. And that is why the seven stars constellation is a part of Revelations 12 woman. They rep represent the same concept, God's people. The seven stars represent the seven churches of Asia. So this is his teaching. And then uh, the five stars up above 
is said to be the five wise virgins, you know, is what people say. That's what the seven and the five here on this Corona, which, you know, I think there's a point to that. Uh, so let's see, nothing really there. So, and then another player in this celestial act is the serpent. So we see that in Revelation 12, one through five, the great red dragon, that serpent. Uh, ancient Greek of this uh, constellation is called serpents, Ophis, uh, the serpent. It's a constellation also in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, so this is from Wikipedia. Uh, it's unique among the modern constellations in being split into two contiguous parts. Serpent's kaput, which means serpent's head. So remember the head, you know, uh, the head and the tail. And then to the west and serpent's cauda, meaning serpent's tail to the east. So here, this constellation not only has a serpent, but it it's the serpent's head and the serpent's tail. And in this picture, uh, this comes from uh, a telescope site. Uh, oh, I guess this is Wikipedia again. So anybody can look up. I think this is under Virgo, uh, or it might be under serpents. It was talking about serpents. Uh, anyway, it, for those that can see this picture, it just it just shows the constellation, and you know it's this kind of long, curvy constellation that could be pictured as a snake. And then there's a picture that Wikipedia gives, uh, also under serpents, of uh, the head, and if you can see that, it's like a. Uh, you know, a V. So the head looks like a V, like a snake with its mouth open. And so, you know, that thing could be arranged so that, you know, he's ready to devour the woman's child, you know, in this celestial picture. So we have seen that all the players are there for Revelation 12 to be actually portraying celestial signs as Jesus said would happen. We saw the moon, we saw the sun, the woman, the crown of 12 stars, the dragon slash serpent, and they are all there in September. So let me switch gears to some more clues to Christ's birth in scripture. And I'll go pretty quick, quick here, but uh, this first one, since we were started so late, uh, is Luke 1.5. So this is where uh, John the Baptist is ready to be born. And it says in verse 5 of Luke 1, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abia or Abijah, you know, Abia, spelled differently, you know, in whatever translation you might be looking at. And he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And verse eight, and it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, because he, you know, this is John the Baptist's dad, he was a, a high end priest because he was, uh, from Aaron, <clears throat> and so came to pass while he executed the priest's office in, in the order of his course. So this is showing that there were courses, uh, a period of time where different ones would serve. Verse nine, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot, uh, was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So, so we know this story where he goes in and uh, the angel of the Lord appears to John. It's really a good story if anybody wants to read that. I, I wanted to read it now, but I, I'm going to have to skip it. 
but the angel of the Lord appears while John is in the mo in the holy place getting ready to burn incense. And it says John was, you know, completely, you know, gripped with fear because here this angel of the Lord is standing in there when nobody is supposed to be in there but him. And so the angel of the Lord says, don't fear, John, because uh, you and Elizabeth are going to have a child in your old age. You know, they were getting kind of old, apparently. And so Zechariah made the mistake of questioning the Lord, because it says he was the angel of the Lord, which is God in a theophanic, you know, as a being manifesting as an angel. And so Zechariah made the mistake of questioning and saying, well, you know, how am I going to know that what you're telling me is true? You know, he, I can't remember exactly what he says, but it was something and it's kind of like, it, you know, so in a sense, the Lord could say, because I'm the one telling you, you know, but the Lord says, because you question me, you're going to be uh, dumb, you know, unable to speak. And I, I can't remember, I think John remained dumb until his son was born. I didn't have time to read the whole story and I couldn't remember it, but that's true. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeannie. Yeah, that's the picture I had that it was right when John's was being ready to be born or born. They were questioning, well, what's his name going to be? Zechariah Jr., right? And then he wrote in the sand or something and said, no, his name is John. And then they were all shocked. And then he, uh, he got his voice back, I think, right at that time. Uh, I think he may have shouted the name. I think he may have shouted at the name and that's when he got his voice. Okay. Anyway, okay. You can double check me. Okay. So uh, more on this order, you know, so we see that when just before, so now uh, there's a verse that says no one with a defect can minister and come into the Lord's house. And so it's very possible that John, that would have been John's last day of his, uh, they had a seven day uh, course. Each, each of these divisions were seven days. Uh, and I'll, I'll show those scriptures. Uh, but he might've only been there, at, you know, that might've been his first and last day. And so, I'm just the only reason I say that is because he then went home, would have been with his wife. And then that's when they believe, you know, is when they would have come together and, and, you know, she would have, uh, whatever the term is conceived. I can't even remember. Uh, is conceived when you're born or, no, or what's it called when you're the seed goes in and conceive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you had it. You got it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so we're using that to say, okay, how long was the gestation? How long, when was John born? And then we kind of know Jesus was six months after that. So we're just given different proofs of how this September birth fits. So First Chronicles 24, 1 says, uh, well, Second Chronicles 35, 5, moreover, stand in the holy place according to the sections of the father's households of your brethren, the lay people, according to the Levites, by division of a father's household. So they have these divisions. First Chronicles 24, 1, now the divisions of the descendants of Aaron were these, and it you know, they come down and they talk about, you know, these different ones. Uh, so there were 24 priestly divisions, courses, who served twice each year for seven days in the spring and seven days in the fall. So that makes 48 weeks. So you say, well, wait a second, the lunar, can uh, lunar can calendar is 51 weeks. So what happens with the extra three weeks? 
And it appears clear from scripture that during the three weeks where all Israel comes down for the three feasts, then all the priests would minister on those three weeks. And so that's why you have 48 plus three being the 51. So it all fits just perfect. But it's a little here and a little there. Uh, so a couple of verses on that, if anybody wants to look it up. First Chronicles 9, 1 through 26. Second Chronicles 5, 11. Uh, here below is Second Chronicles 5, 11. And this below was during the Feast of Tabernacles. So between the 15th and the 22nd of Tishri. So here it says, and all the men of Israel assembled themselves to the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. So Tishri was the seventh month. Uh, and when the priests came forth uh, in verse Second Chronicles 5, 11, when the priests came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions. So this was during another feast. And it's saying at this time, they didn't do it by divisions. And, and it makes sense it would have been because they were all there doing it. Uh, anyway, so I'm just giving you, so here's another one, uh, First Chronicles 9, 25. And their brethren were in the courts to enter in weekly. So there's that weekly from time to time, you know, in other words, as each time during those 24 courses, they would come in weekly from time to time. Uh, NASDAQ or NAS, NASDAQ, NAS says uh, they were to come in every seven days from time to time. So just showing you that all this is uh, kind of provable by scripture. And then, so David, when he set up the, uh, you know, the temple, he wanted God's direction. So he was asking, you know, they, he had them cast lots for when each priest would uh, do. And you see down here in, uh, where are we? Uh, I think, well, I'm sorry, I don't even know what the Bible reference is, but just look for the eighth for Abijah. So the first course was Jehoiarib. The first lot came out for Jehoiarib and the eighth for Abijah. So that's the one that John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, is in. He's the eighth. So that means that would have been about two week, two months later, you know, four weeks, plus maybe a, a week for Passover, uh, after the first lot. Uh, and then, so David gave all these instructions for these, you know, he, he went through all the different lots and... Uh, And then he adds, you know, about these others who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, cymbals, and the number of those who performed the ser their service was so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, so anyway, I just added that to say that it was not just the letter of the law, but there was singing and music and worship were a part of what God was doing there. <clears throat> or as Nehemiah says, uh, you know, they were there to praise and give thanks as prescribed by David, the man of God, division corresponding to division or division course by course or division by division. Uh, so first Chronicles 28, 11, then David gave his son Solomon the plan of the porch, the temple, you know, this is the plan as they're building that out. And then verse 13, also for the divisions of the priests and the Levites. So their divisions, David handed that to Solomon. So uh, I know this 
kind of stuff isn't the most edifying, but uh, I'm just kind of throwing this out so you can see there is some real set things that you can kind of go by in the scriptures to say when this was. Now, Second Chronicles 23, 4 says, uh, this is the thing which you shall do. One third of you of the priests and Levites who come in on the Sabbath shall be gatekeepers. So it's showing here that these, uh, the, the change each week, which makes sense, would be every Sabbath, a new course would come in. I remember in the, when I was doing the Passover book, the Messianic Feast, that I remember reading that, that uh, the, the doors to the temple, they would come for the morning offering, and then the, do the doors would shut. And then again at noon, they would open things up. And so that's what it, the history kind of shows is that at noon, the new group of seven would come in and then that week, you know, they would be ministering and doing things. And then he says, but let no one enter the house of the Lord except the priests and the ministering Levites. They may enter for they are holy. So this is talking about the, the house, I believe here is referring to the most holy place and the holy place, those two the very center of the temple. And let all the people keep the charge of the Lord. Uh, going down to verse 8, who were to come in on the Sabbath. So here, again, it shows uh, with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. So again, it shows one group coming in, one group going out. So I said all that to say, and I had known that information from the Jewish uh, Messianic group that I had rented a building to back in uh, 1983 or so. So, you know, I learned some really interesting things from the, the Jewish scholars that they see a lot of things that a lot of Gentile scholars don't see because of their background. Anyway, uh Nisan 1 in 4 BC was on March 29th. So this is from Ernest Martin, page 76 through 78. Uh, his book is The Star That Astonished the World. Uh, it's uh, the first heading is The Star of Bethlehem. I don't know if you can see this. If I put it right in front of me, I found you can see it, but uh the star of Bethlehem. So this is page 70. I'm quoting from him. So he says, Nisan 1 in 4 BC was on March 29th. That would begin the first course of the priests, because every year Nisan 1 was the beginning of uh, Exodus 12 talks about that, that this is the beginning of months, Nisan, for the uh, religious calendar. So then he says the Sabbath prior to Nisan 1 is when that would have started, which is March 24th. This appears to be when they would begin their first course and then change each Sabbath. When adding a week for Passover, so that would not have been counted in the 24 courses, the eighth course of Abia would have been from May 19th to May 26th. So he's laying this out. So he says, Zechariah was struck dumb and thus disqualified to continue in his priestly office. And he quotes Leviticus 21, 16 through 23. And would no doubt then leave for home. Thus, Elizabeth conceives sometime around May 26 to June 1st. Human gestation is a period of 280 days. This all comes from uh, Ernest Martin. Nine months and 10 days, which that was new, something I didn't know. Uh, this shows a birth for John the Baptist near March 10th, 3 BC. He continues. So this is for the birth of Jesus. 
Luke says that Jesus was conceived because he's going to give us an exact date here in a little bit. So hang on. If I hope this hasn't been boring, all that stuff, but I thought it's important. So Luke says that Jesus was conceived sometime in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Luke 126, comma, th and verse 36. Five full months had passed, and Elizabeth was then in her sixth month. So probably possibly just beginning her sixth month. So the end of her fifth month and just into the sixth. Since John was born sometime around March 10th, 3 BC, then Jesus would be born near September in 3 BC. And here I say Al's note, we, we know that Jesus died at Passover. So being age 33 and a half, i.e. cut off in the midst of the week, like Daniel says, and going backwards from that Passover six months would put you right in the month of tabernacles. Uh, so that's another way to look at this. We do know that Jesus for sure was crucified at Passover. So if you go six months for that 33 and a half, if you go back to his birthday at age 33, it would have been six months previous to the Passover, which would have been right at the, you know, the time for the uh, Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So those two are always, they're like on bookends. They're six months apart from each other. As Ernest Martin points out, with the priestly courses alone, one cannot arrive at the exact birth of Christ. He says that Ramsey, this is another scholar researcher who's written some books. I have some of his books, but they were kind of sleepy, so I didn't really get into them much. But uh, he says that Ramsey showed that considerable confidence can be placed on the date for the Roman census to be during August to, sep to October. So that with September right in the middle, that would fit. Because remember, they, that's where they were called to Bethlehem. They had to go for the census when Mary gave birth. They had to go to the city of their birth, you know, each of the Jewish people. So he goes on with this census of Quirinius on page 75, he says this would have occurred from August to October in 3 BC. So Luke 2.1, uh, that was just before the Zechariah uh, that I read earlier, about five verses before, it says, now it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So they have records of witness Quirinius. And so that's, you know, it's just another historical point that shows when this census would have been right around that September time. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city, Luke 2, 3. And uh, maybe I actually, uh, I, I, I misspoke when I said this was right at the same chapter with Zechariah. But, uh, but anyway, so Luke 2, 4, Joseph went up from Galilee, uh, you know, from the city of Nazareth, where he lived, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was going up so he wouldn't get in trouble with uh, Caesar's proclamation. Uh, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. So while they were in Bethlehem for this census, Mary gives birth. And she gives birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in the manger 
because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, you know, probably because so many people had come in to Bethlehem, Jews that lived in different nations and all over for the census. You know, they didn't get there in time to get a room, so they were they couldn't stay in the inn. Uh, verse 8, and in the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you news of great joy. So remember that. The day Jesus was born, this was news of great joy. We're going to see how that fits, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Some have said that Jesus would have been born at the Feast of Tabernacles, rightly thinking that it would be on a major feast day. But as Ernest Martin points out in his book, Rome would not have a census during the Jewish feast because most all of the Jews would be busy at Jerusalem with the festival. So Joseph and you know all the Jews from all 12 tribes, God had required all males to come up to Jerusalem three times in the year. And so it wouldn't have been during the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of uh, Tabernacles is what he's saying. And I think he makes a very good point that I had never thought of uh, because he'd have a war on his hands trying to get the Jews to come away from a feast that God has commanded them to come to Jerusalem and be at. Uh, but there was not, this was not so for the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, called, or what we call the Feast of Trumpets which is actually called a shouting for joy in the Hebrew. It's a shouting. Uh, and so I have hint, hint here. It kind of fits with the angel. You know, I have news of great joy on this day that Christ was born. That fits with Rosh Hashanah, which was not during the feast. It was on the first of Tishri. Whereas the feast happened on the 15th to the 22nd. That was the seven day feast that they had. So they would have had two weeks from the time of the census to get to Jerusalem for the feast. So that would have worked with this census. So reading Exodus 23, 14, God is commanding three times a year, you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. You are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the uh, appointed time in the month Abib, which is Nisan. Uh, for in it you came out of Egypt. And you shall also observe the Feast of Harvest. And, you know, the third one, also the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So this was a, you know, they understood this as a very solid command. And anybody who wanted to be right with God, you know, unless they had a major reason, they would be down there. Uh, and the Romans knew that the Jews would rather be slaughtered than disobey God by not going to Jerusalem for the feast. But nothing there would preclude a census and Jesus' birth on the day of trumpets, which was a day of shouting for joy. We have all called, heard it called the Feast of Trumpets, at least that's, I've always called it that and heard of it. But I looked in the scripture and there's nothing that ever calls it the Feast of Trumpets. So it isn't one of the feasts. It's not one of the three feasts that God is talking about there. 
So you won't find that feast in the Bible, at least I, in the translations I looked at. Uh, so here talking about this uh, feast of this uh, trumpets or shouting, uh, Leviticus 23, 24, speak to the sons of Israel saying in the seventh month on the first of the month. So on the first day of this seventh month, which is Tishri, you shall have a rest. Now that doesn't mean, you know, lay down and do nothing. It just means don't do any of your personal work, you know, that you would do, you know, uh, they, they were to have joy on this day. But he, so the scripture continues, a reminder by blowing, and then you see of trumpets is really not in there. So I've greened it out. It's, I, it's uh, italics. The Hebrew just says a blowing, a holy convocation. So that's a coming together, which they could, they, uh, could do in synagogues. It didn't have to be in the temple. So this holy convocation, such as a gathering for reading the scriptures in the temple or in the synagogues, this could have been done in the city of their birth, you know, at the various synagogues that were all around. And then verse 24, say to the Israelites, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is NIV, the same verse. Say to the Israelites on the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts, literally shouts for joy. So the, this Sabbath, they, they were not to do any personal work on this particular day. Uh, now, we don't know how long the census, it could have been, you know, you show up any day within a week period. I, I doubt it would all been on one day. Uh, and so I don't know, necessarily know that, you know, they couldn't have gone on this day. But anyway, if, if it would have been illegal in their eyes, they probably would have had, you know, several days where this census would have been going on. So the meaning of this word blast or blowing, uh, you know, here it says trumpet blast, but uh, the Hebrew is literally shouts. And I believe it's shouts of joy in this case, uh, because the word means a shout or a blast of war or alarm or joy. So it can be any of the above. But when you're announcing the birth of Christ and you're announcing the feasts that are coming, that would be more a joyful time in this usage here. If it's if the same Hebrew used is used when they're going off to war, then, of course, it would mean a blast of war. But this first day is not a blast of war. This is a a shouting for joy. Uh, so Young's literal, who, you know, usually gets these things pretty good. And Janie, if you want to look up, uh, <laughs> your favorite translation, that'd be great to hear. But anyway, Young's literal says a day of shouting it is to you. So, so yeah, interesting. It's a day of shouting. Uh, so does God want the people to shout for joy all day because it's a New Year's Day party? Or does this day of shouting for joy possibly point forward to Christ's birth? Ernest L. Martin, who we have been discussing, then gives what he believes is the exact date of Christ's verse. And uh, let me put this out. Uh, Maybe nobody send a text so that Lynn can uh, see this, but this is the uh, second picture. People that didn't show up today are probably getting this thinking, you know, what are these things coming out? 
Okay, so Lynn, give me a shout when you see that. I'll let everybody see it together because we're getting to the big part here. Nothing yet. Janie, did you get it on your phone? Don't send a text. Uh, you're on mute, Janie. Oh, I didn't get a date, but I did get an image. Yeah, that's what I'm. Uh, oh, okay. That's it. It's the picture. Okay. Let's see. So, uh, Lynn, I think you got it there somewhere. Um, in text, I have nothing from you. Uh, look in the group text here. I'll send it to your individual too. Is there supposed to be a date on there specific to this? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 I see the lion. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting because the lion, you know, this this circle. So Virgo, the woman here, is, and this is also what's strange is that some people say, well, that that's the sixth or eighth one is is Virgo that it starts over here, but. The better researchers I found say Virgo is the first constellation which would fit because this has Christ being birthed as a lamb. And then Leo is the last one, which is Christ returning as a lion. Oh. So both of these 12 pictures. So here is this book, you know, the, the chapter five, the time of Jesus' birth. So, Here's where he picks the exact day. So you see over to the left here, the moon at seven o'clock at September 6th. And then at seven o'clock on September 7th, the moon is dropping down through mm -hmm. the constellations. The moon at seven on okay. September 8th, September 9th, September 10th. And then it's under her feet on September 11th. So 9-11 is the only day oh. where, where this would work. Oh, 9-11 of and, all days. And let me also say that he wrote this book. Uh, well, I'll show it. I think it's uh, in 1996. So he had no idea what 9-11 mm -hmm. meant. Mm -hmm. He's just going by the solar situation. Yeah. And if you can see where my cursor is, yeah, the sun from August 27th to September 5th is clothing the woman. It's right along her breast down to her mm -hmm. waist it, it, during that period. Mm -hmm. And so who knows oh that God. that sun at her stomach could be the woman with child picture. Mm hmm. So, so he writes here, the sun clothing the woman while the moon is under her feet. The only time in the year this occurred and to be observed uh, was from 615 to 745 on September 11th in 3 BC. Everything fits perfectly with this relationship. What what is this below her? It looks like eyeglasses, th real big eyeglasses. Yeah, the one below her would be uh, Libra on the other side of Leo. So Libra is, and then you know, then there's a I don't know the bear. Remember, a Job talked about the bear. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if this is the bear or this could be uh, Aries, the lamb, the ram, which is a male lamb. Uh, but anyway, these constellations, God uh, 
painted a picture using them. So, so I say the above picture from Ernest Martin, uh, who, by the way, does not believe Jesus was born on December 25th. He's looking at the constellation in Virgo, whereas the other guys try to look at it from Sagittarius or Capricorn, which happens in December, because they're wanting Christ to be born then. So I think, I think Ernest here is the guy that has it right. So he published this book, 1996, had no concept of the time of the events of 9-11, like we have. Everything he says about 9-11 is based on the constellations at the time of Christ's birth and no other, uh, and the other scripture evidence that we've already seen. So all of that all lines up and fits with this 9-11. And 9-11 in 3 BC just happens to be land on the first of Tishri. So the day of the trumpets shouting. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, we have a solar calendar and the Jews used a moon-based calendar, a lunar calendar. Mm -hmm. So on our calendar, Tishri 1 can sometimes be, you know, a couple of weeks on either side of September 11th. It's all over the map. And so just the fact that it landed in 3 BC right on 9-11 is kind of interesting. Now, of course, this is going to be a traumatic day for the devil. He's going to remember this day. And like he does with everything, he's going to want to, you know, well, two things. He's going to want to change Christ's birthday to December 25th to hide things. But he's also going to want to do a slam down so everybody else can feel the emotions that he feels on 9-11. Uh, I'm just throwing out some thoughts on how I figure this would work. So Ernest L. Martin in his book, The Star of Bethlehem, The Star That Astonished the World, believes that the, well, I've already said this, uh, on page 90, he explains that September 11th, 3 BC just happens to be Tishri 1 on the Jewish calendar, which is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the day of shouting or trumpets, however you want to say that. This is the only day the moon would be located under the woman's feet. And Tishri is in the seventh month, you know, around, I mean, the ninth, seventh Jewish month, but around our September, the ninth month. And it's interesting that I'll just say a quick thing. Septum means seven in Latin. So why are we calling our ninth month September? And same with October. Octo means eight. Why are we calling the 10th month October? That should be the eighth month. Well, in Rome, they added two months to honor Julius and Caesar and Augustus. So we ended up with July and August shoved in. So the other months kept their names, but they moved them forward. December is Deca, which means 10. Well, that became the 12th month. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. I had never known that before. So by that picture, 9-11 would have been the one time where all this would have lined up. So if Satan knows that Jesus was born on 9-11 and possibly the man-child also, that it makes sense that he would want to do the biggest occult ritual of deception that has ever been done to the world on that very day of 9-11. And the dark side would be in with him. So I just have a note here, explain 9-11 as the biggest occult ritual event the world has ever seen. Uh, 
So Satan wants to counterfeit to change reality like he did with the history of the Last Supper being coming the Passover, how those things change and then certain truth can be hidden when things are changed. And he does that with other events. Uh, he knows that Jesus lived 33 years or 33 and a half. So in Freemasonry, they have 33 ascending levels to their perfect man. Uh, and then like we saw, he also changed Christ's birth to Christ Mass, which is a Catholic institution. Uh, this, and December 25th is the date of their Roman sun god. That's... Uh, the solstice, the winter solstice, where God, you know, the sun stops way out for three days, like from the 22nd to the 25th, and then it seemingly comes back alive. So that's when the sun God is resurrected and comes back. So they, you know, put that as Christ's deal. Just a couple things here. So you see the skull and bones. So uh, both George Bush and his father went to Yale and both of them were admitted into this skull and bones, probably one of the most powerful societies, secret societies in the world. Only 15 men from the whole world are allowed into this each year. So, you know, you just think, and, and, and you know, several of them are, well, I don't know, I can't remember how many, but have been our presidents, but including the two Bushes. So Jenna, you see the 322 underneath here in this picture of the Skull and Bones Yale Society. Uh, some people say that refers to Genesis 322, where the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil and now lest he stretch forth his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever so they're they're seeing that they're going to become god as it were and live forever by knowing good and evil that's a freemason when you get to the higher levels that's a part of it so here's a picture of freemason you know if you study these things, you find out that George Washington, our very first president, was a Freemason. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean he was a good or bad guy. I don't know. All we know is what's been told by those who write history that he was really a good guy. He, he may have been or he may, you know, have also been working for the Freemasons, but their picture of him, you always see this with free masonry the white and black squares you'll see it in a lot of hollywood movies and a lot of whenever you see that that's the representation of the good to know good and evil you have the black the dark and the white the light uh so this might have been why my whole system locked up because i was going to show this video uh so I'll try this again and hopefully have better results. Uh, if I can get this to work. Give me one second here. Okay, looks like it's going to work. So I just have to uh, stop screen share and then start a new one. And I'll see if I can play this. So can everybody see that picture? I can, yeah. Okay. Well, those that don't have a screen, so right. this, is, this is George Bush Sr. speaking to 
Congress or whoever, you know, all the official people in the White House. And if you see the date here, this is 9-11. So, and then we know his son would preside over 9-11 uh, 11 years later. Uh, but you see these major things and, and here he's going to talk about this is like the first major big time where they came out publicly and announced this coming new world order. So I'll play this. I think I'll have to put it on speaker here and go off ears for a minute. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can you hear me now. Yes, like, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so here we go. I'll play this short clip. A new partnership of nations has begun. And we stand today at an extraordinary moment. The crisis in the Persian Gulf, as tremendous as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective a new world order. That was September 11th, 1990, a speech to a joint session of the United States Congress by then President George H.W. Bush, who was the 43rd Vice President and member of the Skull and Bones Order, whose signature number is 322. His son, George Bush Jr., the 43rd U.S. President, also of 322 Skull and Bones, would oversee the 9-11 attacks 11 years later. 43, 322, Okay, so let me uh, get back to my sermon screen here. So, so yeah, just uh, for those that maybe haven't, oops, let me get my ears back on. Sorry, just one second. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thumbs up, Janie? Yeah. Okay, yep. great. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, so, you know, that might seem a little weird if anybody hasn't had a lot of research into 9-11, but uh, one thing I can promise is that it was done by the dark side. Uh, I was kind of fighting it at first, but then once I started looking, because I thought it was kind of a commie, you know, against the right wing Republican kind of deal. And, you know, I had sent money to Bush for his presidency and I was, you know, hook, line and sinker going that way. But... <laughs> Uh, the more I started looking into it, it became real obvious. Like one of the main things for me was uh, they came out and they said, oh, we found uh, there's been some large uh, puts placed on these airline stocks and other stocks that would be adversely affected by 9-11. And a put is when you place a large amount of money well you don't doesn't have to be large but these were very large that a, a stock price is going to go down it's just going to tank like united airlines so if you knew something like this was going to take place you could make a lot of money well the the media you know because sometimes the even though the media is fully controlled sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing Obviously, they're not going to tell Joe Schmo at, at, at Como News, you know, that this is a planned thing and whatever. And so various news agencies were saying, hey, they are on to some stuff because they're finding these large uh, bets were made 
on against these stocks, you know. So I remember hearing that and I'm thinking, oh man, they're gonna get Mustafa and Muhammad and you know, they're gonna be able to bust these people, you know, who's who did this. And so then all of a sudden, like within a day or two, it was kind of like hush hush and oh, we can't talk about that, and oh, don't worry. Uh but it's like if it would have been Mustafa and Muhammad, you know, they would have drug him forth and you'd see him walking along in an orange jumpsuit with the media asking him questions. But no, no more questions after that, because they realized it was the insider boys who were placing these bets. You know, maybe you're a brother of so and so and, you know, different ones that are up high, high up directing things. Remember, these two buildings were Rockefeller built and owned, and he sold them just whatever it was six months before 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, like I say, I don't want to go into all that, but it was all set for a certain day, and it was led by Satan, and 9-11 was this traumatic day that really is responsible for bringing in this new world order where now we got to take our shoes off at the airplane and be strip searched practically. And, uh, you know, we're losing all our rights because everybody's a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we used to be free America. And then, you know, they've used these things to be able to bring in their authoritarian, uh, authoritarian control grid more and more as the days go on. As with the vaccines and everything else. Uh, I give you a couple more points on 9-11. Yeah, let me read uh, this first. Uh, so Isaiah 66, 7, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. So uh, who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? So shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So I'm just wanting to say that here is a picture of, of the man child possibly be being born in one day, just like Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came down and he was anointed for ministry, it was like for 30 years he hadn't done miracles and now everywhere he's going, God's presence is with him and he's doing powerful miracles and so and so. Uh, Lynn, if you don't mind, let me just finish. And if if we, because I have to finish, no I know 9-11, we no could problem. go on for 15 to 150 hours, but I just want to get done with this. And then if we have time, you can make whatever points if you don't mind. So back on uh, the 9-11 date, Ecclesiastes 1-9, that which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. And remember that God fulfilled Passover on the very day. And God fulfilled Pentecost on the very day. So could he also re uh, fulfill Christ's birthday and what that points to on the very day of 9-11? The day of shouting. So. Here is a picture of the Aish calendar. So do we have a day coming out ahead when Tishri 1 falls on September 11th? Because if it's going to be just like that, and, and remember, as I said, Tishri can fall on any day of the month within a couple of weeks of 9-11. So, you know, you might go some years and not have it fall right on 9-11. So here is uh, the Jewish calendar, uh, Aish calendar, and this is showing uh, 
let's see here, 2022. And it's showing that in 2022, Tishri 1, the, the Feast of Shouting, or the Day of Shouting, happens on 20, uh, September 26th. So let me show this for those that can see. It's just a calendar, you know, a picture of a month, and it shows Rosh Hashanah happening on September 26th. The purple over here is the English calendar, and then over here, the blue is Tishri 1, showing that that's Rosh Hashanah on the 26th. So we know it's not this year, so everybody can take a deep breath. Uh, and however, in 2026, we do have a setup that seems to fit. So that's in four years. So if, now this isn't anything from his book because he's not saying Revelation 12 is speaking of a man child or a future event. Uh, but we know that it happens during the seventh head of the world government. So scrolling down here, you can see this is September of 2026. And you can see uh, Tishri 1 falling on Saturday, which uh, they're saying is uh, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, but remember, these calendars can be off by a day one way or the other. There's some tricky things involved. For one thing, the Hebrew calendar, uh, you know, ends at 6 p.m., whereas our September 11th calendar goes till midnight. And in, in Jesus' day, they would have to wait until they could visibly see the new moon before they would proclaim it as the first day of Tishri. So I'm just saying, I'm looking for a calendar where it's either on the 10th through the 12th. So here's Rosh Hashanah on the 12th. So September 26th would work. And I'm scrolling ahead here. This is another website, Time and Date, where they give uh, moon phases. So they could tell by my internet that I was in Olympia. So in 2026, they're showing it. If you see this left column, these are the new moons. They're showing that the new moon happens on September 10th. Now, I would believe this over the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish, because like I say, they move things. They sometimes move it forward a day when uh, the feet in a year where the Feast of Atonement is going to fall right next to the Sabbath because they don't want to have two complete Sabbaths in a row because that would be hard on people for, you know, not being able to cook and do things. Uh, but that wasn't so in Jesus' day when God initiated these things. So I'm just saying there's several different little factors where it could, it could make it slide one day or this way or one day that way. Having said all that, you can see that in Olympia, the new moon, according to the moon phases, so this is, you know, astronomical science, the new moon would be September 10th at 827 p.m. But Jerusalem time is 10 hours ahead of us. So that means the new moon falls 9-11 in Israel on the 26th. I mean, wow. in, in 2026. So that is hard line 9-11 Tishri 1. Now, you know, I'm not trying to give a prediction. I'm just saying this is what the facts show. Uh, if, so I say here, notice that the new moon is September 10th, but that's 827 Olympia time. Jerusalem is 10 hours ahead. So that happens 9-11 Jerusalem time. 
And not amazing. Nine eleven also happened on Jerusalem time because I think it was ten a.m. New York time. So seven hours later would have still been nine eleven Jerusalem time. And in fact, I never thought of this, but that would have been right about the time of Christ's death, from the not, the time when the Passovers, from the ninth to the eleventh hour, from three to five p.m. So. Uh, and if the man child is a three and a half year ministry fulfilling the second half of the week in Daniel, then this September 26 birthing would align perfectly with the huge new world order plans they have for 2030, which you may have heard is the United Nations uh, transforming event called transform. And I, I copied this from the UN website. It says, transforming our world, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So they've got big plans for 2030. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they know, you know, they're a lot smarter than we might think at those high demonic satanic levels. As I say, they probably knew 9-11 before most Christians had an idea. So the woman constellation, I've already said, is from 824 to 923. So 911 happens in Virgo. Either way, it does appear from the scriptures that the seventh world government will be in place first with a crown when the man child is birthed. So that means we're going to have to see world government sometime in the next few years. Uh, and uh, however, things can happen very fast once the switch is flipped. And just FYI, there is another year a few years later that could also possibly fit. And that's in the year 2029. So as I say, none of this is rock solid or hard fast predictions, but I do find it very interesting and with lots of possible points to say that 9-11 is the birthing of Christ. And so therefore the birthing of the man child on that day seems very possible. But here's the Jewish calendar in 2029 and Rosh Hashanah, Tishri 1 happens to fall on September 10th. So, as I say, if it's pushed a day one way or the other, you know, that would be another year in which that would line up. Hmm. Uh, and here's another thing I just uh, this is only on screen share, I know, but uh, so he, Hebrew, the Jewish people had two calendars. One was civic and one was religious. So if you see the second column here, this is the religious one that starts in Nisan because that's when the Passover. So that's their religious, the feasts are done in these months. So that's why Tishri is the seventh, but Tishri is also called the first month because it's the first month of the new civic year. Uh, but the point is that Nisan and uh, Tishri are the seventh and first. So Nisan is the first in one calendar and the seventh in another. And Tishri is the first in one and the seventh in the other. So again, and they both happen during right about the time of the equinoxes, the uh, spring equinox and the autumnal, you know, the September equinox and the April or March. I mean, so six months apart, John being birthed during the Passover time in the that equinox and then six months later Jesus being birthed at the September equinox. So anyway, there's there's all the pieces of the puzzle. 
and uh, if everybody has, uh, it looks like we might have lost a few. Uh, did we lose a few or did we? Mary Catherine's guests were arriving, so she had to log off. Okay. She had, yeah, she sent a chat. Okay. Uh, so it looks like, okay, so we have uh, Lynn and Mark still. Lynn, if you uh, were very late at 6.30, but if you want to have five minutes to make some points, please jump in. I only had a couple things with, in regards to 9-11. Um, first, anybody can look up James Corbett, the Corbett Report, and go to his um, long list of excellent research information on 9-11. One video in particular I highly recommend is 9-11 Trillions, Follow the Money. That's an yeah. excellent video, and it gives you all of the banking information, all of all of the sinister stuff that went down with the airlines, with everybody that were all in cahoots together to create 9-11. And 9-11 was planned years in advance. So it's not like, oh, yeah. it just happened to happen that day. Because there were no um, there were no Muslim hijackers, right. bottom line, straight up. Not right. none at all. And then the Israeli art students rented um, a floor on, um, I think it was Tower One, and in that, on that entire floor, it was filled with uh, everything used, everything having to do with um, controlled demolition, blasting caps, boxes and boxes packed, packed to the ceiling with blasting caps. That those buildings were controlled demolition from start to finish, and um, and most of the Jews, if not all Jews, that um, that went to work in that building were warned ahead of time. Do yeah. not go to work on 9-11. Yeah, These they got an email. Things. They got an email. So all that, yeah. So all that stuff is there. It was all known about in advance. James Corbett, the Corbett Report .com. Excellent let me, let, source of information for 9-11. Let me throw one more in there that I think is really good. And if anybody wants it, uh, is an interview between uh, Aaron Russo, the film projector guy, the film uh, maker, yes, excellent. and Alex Jones, where Aaron Russo testifies that Rockefeller got a hold of him and said, hey, do you want to be uh, in the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, because he saw that Aaron Russo, he knew he was Jewish and he was making some big waves. And, and uh, anyway, uh, and this was before 9-11, and Aaron, like nine months before, and Aaron Russo says that Rockefeller, through an attorney lady they know, you know, contacted him and said, hey, you know, how about you getting together for dinner? And they kind of became somewhat friends, and they would talk about business and different things. And Rockefeller told him that an event was coming, and he said it was going to be a big scam, and he's a big uh, phony thing. And he says, because of this, we're going to be going and looking in caves for people. And it's all going to be a big ruse. And he says, I can't tell you what it is. Uh, and I'm, I'm not being very good at explaining it right now. I'm not, it's not come flowing real well. But anyway, it was real obvious that he was talking about 9-11 that then happened, you know, six or 12 months later. And like Lynn says, not only was it planned ahead of time, but it was the numbers and the way things line up, you know, it was planned when Rockefeller built the buildings. There's mm. all kinds of things that uh, were put it's, into effect. So it, it's a long range plan that they yeah. have for Set this world yeah. global government. They knew it would take three world wars and uh, all these kinds of things. But, but anyway, uh, I think I need to let everybody go because I got to go. And, uh, but uh, this was excellent. <laughs> thank you, Jeannie. Appreciate that very much. Uh, really interesting. Really, was, really interesting. It was quite an ordeal putting it all together, but I uh, can only imagine. <laughs> and I just am you thankful. Know, Al, I know. 
uh, Robin name? Anderson's husband. Robin Anderson's husband. Yeah. I can't think of his first name. Yeah, I Robin know who you're Anderson's talking of. Husband. He he has done oh in years past. He was in this arena of study with the dates and the numbers and the moon cycles and stuff. And he had he was pinpointing some stuff. He was off. He he got off on a calendar date for something that he thought was going to be happening was the rapture that he thought was going to be happening by a certain by 2017 and it didn't happen. But um, I think Robin's husband might be one to reach out to to find out if he's been doing any more research about any of this. And see what he's just come up with. I haven't talked with them in years. Yeah, from but, what I heard, I, he is I, kind I, of inward and doesn't like to come out and talk to anyone. Uh, well, yeah, I get that, but he does. But he does. He does talk to people. You know, okay. one on one, he's fine. Um, but this might be of real interest to him. You know, what you've discovered, because that would be your um, mutual communications. You know, about this. Yeah, so, and Lynn, it's funny because you and I were talking about Rambo last night, and after our uh, texting, uh, I saw that he just came out with a new video, and I watched it, and I decided to sign up for Patreon so I could, you know, get his things right when they come out. And also, you know, you get stuff that isn't on YouTube. But anyway, I was looking and reading, and in a video, like two videos ago, he was talking about Jesus. And now it's sad because he doesn't, I, I kind of get the feeling he's another one of these guys that doesn't believe Jesus was real, but they're really good at knowing, uh, exposing occult things, but they, they don't have all truth. But he was saying in those comments that the, the uh, being called Jesus was given a birth date of 9-11. And so, I, <laughs> yeah, I had never seen that before. And I, so I, I wrote him a message and uh, I don't know if he'll respond, but I, you know, you can, in Patreon, you can send him private messages. Uh, and I sent him one. And I said, uh, thank you, Rambo, because he said, sent, had sent me one at 8.53 this morning saying, thank you for your support. And I said, thank you, Rambo. I'm glad to be a new subscriber. Uh, I was reading in the comments last night that you said you had reasons for a birth of Jesus to be on 9-11. I have watched a bunch of your videos and don't remember hearing that very fascinating do you happen to know where you could point me to see why you believe that maybe one of your videos or whatever led you to that uh thank you so much i just love your videos so if uh if i get anything back from him i'll sure let everybody know who now who is he when you said that i was thinking of sylvester stallone you know <laughs> i think it's just like a nickname that he goes by i don't sure. think he, name Huh? Yeah. He um, he, name. he follow he understands the astrological signs, the he understands uh gematria and numerology. Um he understands oh. gematria really okay. well. Um he really understands the signs in the heavens. For and for not I, I, when I have listened to him via Zach Hubbard, I do not get the the callousness. Zach Hubbard is totally like he's on the he's on the spectrum of totally demonic at times. Just his attitude. His knowledge is great, but his attitude is terrible concerning Jesus. But he, um, anyway, I, teaches him a I'm going to have to jump. Yeah. I'm sorry, but great, great uh, guy. Much love, everybody, and have a good week. And I have yeah. to close this down. But uh, yeah, Rambo's a lot better than Zach for sure. But anyway, thank you. Love you all. And thank you, everyone, for the thank comments. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, God bless. Robert. Good night. Bye.